Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I sense that uh, some of us are looking to receive some answers from our weaknesses. Okay, and this is uh, the theme of our message today, to struggle through our weakness. Now, I believe we are all prone to weaknesses. And some of us know very well where our weakness lies. Uh, and, and some of us prefer not to focus on our weaknesses because we feel so inadequate and we don't want to feel the reproach. So we rather focus on things that are positive about us. But whichever it is, I believe if we have lived long enough, our weakness is a reality to us. We would have seen in ourselves by now probably um, some very obvious inability in our lives or some consistent failures or even character flaws. You know? And I, some of us, know we just cannot do well in certain areas of our lives consistently. Maybe because we don't know, but we have tried our best. Yes, be it in work, in studies, some of us. But we still didn't do well. You know, we are quite disappointed, discouraged by our failures and all. And many of times we see that as a weakness. Um, so we are trying to struggle through those things. And sometimes I could see that some of our weakness is relational, you know, you know, it's a relational, meaning interpersonal. Some of us, we can do mundane work, okay, but we cannot deal with people. We cannot manage people. We cannot deal with people's emotions. Sometimes we get frustrated or wounded easily because of people's words or comments about us. So I think it's very common, it's very common, okay, because I see some people, they are very resourceful, but they, they get very flustered, you know, when they are dealing with people. And this is one of the weakness also, if you know, because, you know, we human beings, we are not machines. We are created to interact with people. We are emotional beings. So somehow, if you find yourself doing mundane work, but if you cannot communicate or interact with people, there is a form of frustration in you. So many people would see that as a weakness also. And then I saw some of us, in fact, all of us, we have certain traits of character flaws where we know we shouldn't be doing things a certain way, but we keep doing it. Say, for instance, we know we shouldn't laze around, but we're still lazing around, you know. Many a times, you know, we know we shouldn't waste time. We're still wasting our time fiddling with our handphones. We know we shouldn't be gossiping about people. But sometimes we still gossip. You know, some people tell me, Pastor, we know we shouldn't say those things, criticize people. But somehow, when we put others down, we feel better about ourselves. I don't know whether that's true for some of us. I think many of us, right? So it's a form of weakness, even though the Bible has tell us to bear with one another, love one another. But we struggle with those things in our lives. And we know our weakness is a reality in this body of sin, which we struggle with every day. And some of us really struggle with sins, as I could see. Um, like some people are struggling with pornography, unforgiveness, vanity, living a wayward life, and all. And the struggling is becoming so much. And I saw some people just feeling numb about all those things. And then ultimately, you just give yourself over to your weaknesses. And you let it control you, take charge of you, and all. Now, I understand that it's frustrating, okay? Sometimes it, it, it is helpless, you know, struggling through our weakness. As what the apostles say, I desire to do good, but I couldn't. And the evil I know I shouldn't be doing, but I keep on doing it and all. Now, the thing with weakness is, it, when it clings to us, it makes us feel cringe, disturbed, and helpless. It invites a like, voice of accusation. It makes it very hard for us to exercise faith and love, even though you, you know you should. You know, but when a weakness hits you, it grips you, you find yourself not being able to live a life of faith. You know. um, but there is one thing good about weakness. Like I'm going to talk about this. Okay? What is it good? 
Now, simply said, weakness reduce us to humility. You understand that? And it's so important for us Christians to know that we are weak, to realize the reality of our sinful nature. So be it how successful you are, what kind of achievements you have in this life, you will always stand humble before God. You will not find excuses for your weakness, but rather you will look to God for more grace, more grace, God. For God gave grace to the humble, right? But be careful, everyone, okay? Be careful, all of you. Many people doesn't look at weakness that way. Even for Christians, some Christians. I realize not <clears throat> sometimes if we don't know how to see our weakness in the light of the gospel, our weakness might make us succumb to evil. As we could see, some people, when they are faced with weakness, they felt so ashamed, so inadequate, then they start to self-justify. Now, they refuse to admit that it's their problem. Every time they met with problem or cannot meet up to people's expectation, they get into trouble with people, they would say, no, this is not my problem. It's someone else's problem. This is circumstantial problem. You know, I work with young people. You know, sometimes when you deal with them, young people who are in and out of job, and when you deal with them, sometimes they say, you know, it's not my problem, it's my boss problem, my colleague's problem. You know, this company policy problem, not my problem. So the thing is, when we refuse to admit our weaknesses, we will try to find excuses. And in, in God's eyes, that, that is a form of complacency, self-justification, self-centeredness. And as you could see in this era, you know, people nowadays, you know, when, when we talk about weaknesses, it feels very bare. Um, so people don't want to dwell on that. They want to talk about let's be positive, uh, look at what we are good at, have positive energy. You know, this world is cruel enough, and people are feeling very sensitive, getting more fragile. So we don't want to talk about weakness. So eventually, I could see they don't come to terms with their weaknesses, but rather they try to escape from talking about that. All right. So as you can see, especially with this era, this generation, people are getting very sensitive towards words. People are very particular about the choice of words. And <clears throat> I've said this before many times, like sometimes you know, as educators in, in school, you know, I myself had kids, they went to school, you know, um, my, uh, my wife and I, you know, sometimes we mingle with other parents. Uh, parents get very affected when the teachers you use the wrong words, your wrong usage of words. And when they go to class, why are you so stupid? Why are you so slow? Why are you not getting it? You know? When they use terms like that, parents are very affected. Parents say, no, why did the teacher use such strong words? You, know, you should say, be more attentive instead of why are you so slow. You should say, be more proactive. You know? Don't use the word stupid and all. No, you know, this kind of thing. We see people talk about that, you know. You know, last time when I was doing my math sum and I cannot get my sums right, my, my dad would always say, why are you so stupid? And twist my ear, you know. The kind of thing. But I turn out fine. <laughs> but I'm not saying that we should talk to our kids this way. But what I'm saying is people doesn't want to come to terms with their weaknesses. But as I could see from the Bible, the Word of God is pretty frank about our weaknesses. The Word of God wants us to be upfront about it. We shouldn't escape talking about weaknesses. And I believe I dwell a lot on all these weaknesses message, you know. So, like right today, we want to see, all right, our own weaknesses. We want to see how to see it in the light of the gospel, okay? So, I'm going to read with you quite a few scripture verses, okay? Pull up the scriptures. Okay, we're going to read with you quite a few, and we try to make inference from there. 2 Corinthians, okay, chapter 12. Okay, these are the, the, the verses that we read just now. And this is what Paul said. Now, just if you have a paper or whichever in a handphone, you know, you can just, because we're going to read quite a lot, you can write something, you know, and see how to make inference, you know, from this scripture. 
This is what the Apostle Paul said. Because of this great surpassing revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, keep me from being proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. You see, I was given, and God is not stopping that, okay? Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, you saw that? God's power made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Now, it seems so easy, you know, but it's not, okay? So I, I'm going to bring you through this scripture so that you can understand what is this all about, what is the background. So right now you see there is a thorn in Paul's flesh. What is it? He didn't say, okay? There are many explanations given about the thorn in Paul's flesh. What is it about? You know, it could be an illness, it could be a persecution that he's facing constantly. It could be an ongoing difficulty. Or it could even be a sin that he is struggling with. But the fact is, the thorn makes him feel weak. It feels disturbing. If you all have a thorn on your feet, you know, it's always disturbing. So he prayed to the Lord to remove it, as if most of us would have prayed. Now, you look at the verse, you will know. For obvious spiritual reasons, the Lord didn't remove the thorn. Why? Now, for very good reasons. The simple reason given is to keep him from becoming conceited, from becoming proud. Because when you get proud, you will start to self-glorify and then you will end up in destruction. You get what I mean? And so the Apostle Paul on one hand, you know, he is given great revelation. None other, other apostle has that kind of revelation and insight. And even the glimpse to the heavens of God, the glory of God, none of it. But you see, he was given that kind of anointing. But at the same time, he has to be given that thorn so that he wouldn't get proud. Now, you see the spiritual constraint here? Do you see that? The constraint. Now, it's so good to have revelation. But it was so bad and destructive if you turn proud because of that anointing and special privilege that you have. So to keep him being constantly anointed and also remaining humble such that he can always constantly depend on God's grace and not grow proud, he was given that tone. Now, you saw that? So sometimes we cannot come to terms with certain of our weaknesses. You know, sometimes we ask God, God, why did you allow certain things to happen in my lives? Why, why do I have some defects? Or why can't I be normal and healthy? Or why am I a slow learner? Or why could I succeed in the way people are succeeding? So we ask all these questions, you know, but I think this verse gives a very, very good explanation. Okay? It gives a very good explanation. It says that God has his profound reasons to keep you humble. So you will keep on receiving more grace, more anointing from him without getting proud. Now that's the thing. So that you will delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, difficulties. For when I am weak, no choice but to keep depending on him, then I'm made strong again, you see? I know it's very hard. Sometimes when we are going through hardship, difficulties, and we feel weak, we tend to try to reason with God. We will say, God, why must you use that weakness to constrain me? I mean, I, I, can, I can be successful, but I can still give glory to you. God, I'm sure I can. You know, I wouldn't get proud. Don't worry about me, God. Just bless me and then make me the kind of person I want to be, you know, healthy, normal, successful, and then I'll give glory to you. Now, we say that. We say that to God. But I think God knows better. 
because I have been through 30 years of my Christian life. And I realized it's so easy to get complacent. It's so easy to want that ease and comfort in our lives and not do anything to love God more or love the church more. So sometimes, you know, I think God has his reason. Even as you struggle through your weaknesses, okay, I'm, I'm coming to all, this, all these answers I've given you, okay. Now let's go to another verse, okay. Just look at what the psalmist say, okay. This is what King David prayed. <clears throat> Pray to the Lord and he will hear you. He will save you from all your trouble. The Lord is close to those who have suffered disappointment. He saves those who are discouraged. Good people might have many problems. Good people, actually the Bible didn't use good. It used righteous, righteous people. Righteous people might have many problems. But the Lord will take them all away. He will protect the righteous completely. Not one of their bones will be broken. No. You know, that is the sum for the Messiah. You know, Jesus was on the cross, his bones was not broken. But over this verse, okay, I, I want to make reference to the problems that we have. You know, sometimes when we are weak, we cry to the Lord. And who cry to the Lord, people? The righteous. So there is two things you can imply from this scripture. Okay, number one, first, it doesn't mean that the righteous will not have weakness. The righteous will have Weakness will encounter desperate and helpless moments. Okay, who are the righteous? Okay, in simpler terms, righteous are Christian, okay, or people who are true, true believers of God. We call them the righteous, okay? These people will have their desperate and helpless moment. And they cry to God. The righteous can be weak. That's why they cry to God. God save me from my trouble. We can be overwhelmed by difficulties or our inability. As I, can, I could see, you know, sometimes even me as a pastor, I'm overwhelmed by problems in the church, in the family, whichever. You know? So I'm not afraid to admit that. So number one, the righteous will have their desperate moments. But number two, the righteous will always have someone to call upon in their weakness. And that is the faithful and righteous God. All right? So God, deliver me. Help me. And God, hear his cries of humility, and God will deliver him. That's the promise. Okay? That's the promise. There will never be one instances that the righteous calling on, the, on God will be put to shame. Okay? That's my experience. Okay? If you are right before God, right before God, Believe that there will be desperate and helpless moment, but call upon the Lord, you will be delivered. Okay, that's the promise of God. Number two, okay, on weakness. Okay, now the, the sermon title today is struggling through your weakness. That's why I need to bring you through all these verses. How you struggle through, you know, don't just endure the pain helplessly and you know, can't do anything about it, and then you feel the exercise of faith and you feel so down. No, not that. I want, I want all of you to understand that is the promise of God given and you need to know how to struggle through. Now, number three. This one is a famous one, okay? Another one for you. Another one for you to understand the glory of God in your weakness. Romans chapter 8, 26. Now, come, can we read this all together? One, two, three. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Now, this, the verse says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Now, what is so disturbing about our weakness? What is so disturbing? That is, we can't pray. We don't know what to pray for. We are feeling very confused. We kept asking, Lord, why? Why did this happen to me? No, so emotionally, we are perplexed and confused. But that is the time, listen, that is the time where the Spirit helps us voluntarily. Voluntarily. The Spirit of God doesn't wait for you to get your act together before He helps you. When you are weak, Christian, when you are weak, down, don't know how to pray, 
You only feel the heaviness in your heart. Now, that is the time where the Holy Spirit groan. Now, the Holy Spirit groan with words that you cannot comprehend. He's interceding for you on behalf. And as a result of that interceding, listen carefully, as a result of the Holy Spirit interceding, your heart, your heart eventually gets better and better. Then you begin to accept certain realities. You begin to see something good in the trials you face. You get what I'm trying to say? Okay, a lot of times people say, Pastor, I'm in the trial. I'm feeling very weak. I don't see God is helping me. I prayed and prayed, I don't see answer prayer. No, God is sustaining you. Okay, of course he knows all you feel is your confusion, is your perplexity, but somehow there is some unseen forces, supernatural strength sustaining you so that you don't fall away. And then progressively, your heart starts to get better. You begin to see your problems in new light. You, you get what I mean? Say, for instance, when I was a student, you know, I studied hard, but I didn't get good results you know, a few times. I was disappointed. When I was working, you know, I put in my effort, but I didn't get the promotion. I, went, I was a little bit disappointed, you know, discouraged. So at a point, the confusion come. You say, God, why? I did what you told me, you know, but I didn't get the kind of reward I'd expect. Then the perplexity come, you know, but as you look to the Lord, as you keep asking, you, you don't just turn to the world, you turn to God. God, why? And somehow, you don't get answers straight away, but after a few weeks, months, and then you begin to see your problem. You, 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 somehow you get out from that mess, you know, you, you tend to see yourself, you begin to see your problems in new light, and then you get over it. You get what I'm trying to say? Now, this is the faithfulness of God. This is the faithfulness of God, opening your heart, bit by bit, to accept His perfect will. Because you know we have a small vessel, but God, in His almightiness and infinity, He's doing much more than we could receive. You see? So somehow we can only take bit by bit. But trust me and believe what the Bible says. Every time when you are weak, you don't know how to pray, all you can do is just look to God, believe that you will not fall away. Somehow the Holy Spirit is interceding for you. You get what I mean? This is the amazing thing about God. Yeah. You, you don't... You don't say, God, I just want to pray today and wake up tomorrow feeling fine, everything fine. No. Answer prayer doesn't come like that. Answer prayer comes when God breaks you again and again through your trials and your weakness. Okay? This is a very important verse about weakness. Okay? And then number four, verse, in the next verse, First Peter. Okay, this one. <clears throat> now listen carefully, okay? Husbands, okay, it's a husband and wife thing. Okay? Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. And treat them with respect as the weaker partner. You saw that? Weaker partner. And as as with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, over here, Bible talks about a gender weakness. Who is the weaker gender? <laughs> now, let's not think about what some people say, the Bible is sexist, you know, it's always putting down ladies, you know, no, no such thing. I saw in this verse that God is loving and considerate towards sisters, towards women. So he's telling the husband, the man, to be a gentleman to the weaker sex, okay? Learn to protect them physically and emotionally. Yeah, your wife is a helper, but she's also weaker. So you need to put up with her weakness and inability at times. Now, the Bible didn't say have pity on her because she's weak. The Bible says honor her. Actually, the, the Greek word is, no, I don't see that there. You know, Treat them with respect. Actually, a better word would be honor her as the weaker partner. Why? Because she's as with you of the gracious gift of life. Probably this means to say that the women, the wife, okay, will deliver your child, you know, she, she will deliver a child into this world, you know, as with you. You get what I mean? 
So she is the one who brings the life into this world, even though she is the weaker one. So God has destined it, ordained it that way. So honor her. Anyway. Okay, next verse, okay. Okay, I'm going to read a lot from the verses so that we can make inference. Later will be very easy for go through. Okay, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And no, that's not the verse I'm looking at. I'm looking at the next one, 2 Timothy. Yeah, for the spirit. Okay, let's read together. One, two, three. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but give us power, love, and self-discipline. Now, this verse is nothing about weakness. But it talks about fear. Being fearful and timid is a kind of weakness. So let us not be afraid to admit that we are fearful at times. We are constrained by our timidity. Sometimes it can be due to our trying circumstances. And we are being threatened, we're being oppressed because of our faith. Sometimes we feel fearful when we are going to evangelize to people. But the Bible says, now, even as you feel fearful, there is another spirit that is given you, the spirit of power, love, and self-control. Now, that is what a Christian should be praying for, even when he is feeling fearful. Okay? Power to do God's will. Okay? Love for others and self-control. Okay? To overcome your flesh. Last one. Okay? Last one. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1. Let's read together. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Now, you see, it's very paradoxical here. Isn't the world controlled by the wise and the strong? The world, look at it. It's controlled by the politicians, the economists, the scientists, the technocrats. Now, it seems so until we are struck with certain realities, like the realities of war, poverty, sickness, and death. Now, if you don't understand this now, you can see this from example. You know, <coughs> say, for instance, we have a few doctors here. Sometimes the medical will celebrate because they found a new medication. And then when a new medication is found for a disease, then new disease sprung up. So the world always have temporal victory. Now, the world was celebrating, you know, when Trump and Kim is going to meet. <laughs> and now you know there's a problem. I don't know how it's going to turn out. But you see, the world always celebrate too fast. But the way God do it is to choose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. So who are the weak? Over here, it meant Christians are weak. Christians, Christians, we admit our inability at times to even talk about God, you know, sometimes, you know, we are faced with constraint. Sometimes when we talk about the need for eternity, we evangelize to people. People say, you know, you Christians, only you people who are weak in the mind go for religion. You get I me? Mean? People say that. Because you cannot live in this reality. That's why you talk about an afterlife. That's what people say. Until sickness and death struck them. That's why. God says he chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And the last verse, please, chapter 9, the last verse says, To the weak, Paul said, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. So you, you look at what Paul is doing. He's trying to beat weakness at his own game. So to the weak, I become like the weak. Why? Because I know weakness is a reality. It's common with mankind. So Paul has learned not to lament and groan over his weakness, but to use it for the gospel. You get what I mean? Use it for the gospel. As and when you will always have weak people around you. So be bold to share about your weakness. Show the humane side of you. I believe Paul always showed the humane side. He, he, he was saying, I worried for my, my people's salvation. I worried about my co-worker's illness. I worried when the church split. I worried when someone fall into sin. Paul was always worrying, but he said, let's pray. Pray and you see God deliver. You saw that? That's a humane side of Christian. It seems that we are so fragile and weak, but as we look to God, we manifest the supernatural strength of God. 
Now, that's the thing I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to put all this together, okay, later. I'm going to very quickly, okay, because the main part of the message is on the scripture. The rest is pretty simple, okay. I'm, I'm going to just quickly go through with you a few things, you know. Weakness comes in many forms, but it always got to do with our sinful nature. It always, okay. I can name you a few kinds of weaknesses. Number one, circumstantial weakness. Circumstantial meaning what? Under certain circumstances or conditions, our weakness just manifests. You look at ourselves. Look at ourselves. Some of us, we get flustered when we are busy. Am I right? We start to grumble and complain when we are busy. Or when we are being criticized or misunderstood. You see, we lose sleep over that. You know, we feel very bitter about that. So this is circumstantial. So you see those signs in you? Now, you know. I want you to understand that circumstantial weakness, although it seems real, but you have to know that it is not the circumstances or the people that cause weakness. Circumstances and people only bring out what is truly in you. The self-centered nature, the nature of wanting to feel comfortable, to feel ease, well like, you know, this is the self-centered. This, so circumstances bring out that weakness in us. Second, what kind of weakness? Consistent weakness. Now, have you ever realized that some of us, many of us, we have consistent weakness? Ever since we are young, we just couldn't break through certain strongholds. Say, some people get emotional easily and consistently. Some get angry periodically for God knows what reasons. They just turn unreasonable, you know, and they couldn't control. You know, control. You know, we have a lot of emotional problem, you know. And that's why nowadays people say, you know, okay, I have special needs, you know. Uh, I'm OCD, you know. I'm uh, ADHD. <laughs> now, you have these names coming out, you know. Sometimes I think this is made believe. Although I know it can be real in certain cases, but nowadays, people, when you, can, when you are faced with helpless temperaments, they say, oh, I have this problem. Um, OCD, ADHD, or I'm slightly autistic, or whichever, you know. Um, I think it's to make ourselves feel good and make other people feel good also, you know, so that you know we have a problem. But this consistent weakness is something that we have, I believe, okay, I believe that first it is, is a made belief sometimes by ourselves, sometimes, okay. Second, you need to see your weakness in the light of the gospel. And all this consistent weakness where we have it since young, you may take many years to be healed after you come to the Lord. Later I'll talk about it, okay. Number three is innate weakness. Innate weakness meaning some people, they are born with it. Some physical defects, okay? Some just born slow. Some people born like quick-tempered. You can see it even in toddlers, you know? You can see their temperaments. Some people grow out of it. Some people don't. And as we all know, there are some nature, undesirable nature in us that is hard to do away with. That's number three, okay? Innate weakness. I, I just give these terms, okay? And number four, develop weakness. Meaning you have bad habits. Why? Because you have lived in it, some sins or some bad habits for so long, and you start to develop this kind of nature, undesirable nature in you. Some people lace around long enough and then they develop habitual weakness, laziness. Some people just waste their time, you know, fiddle with handphones uncontrollably, play online games, and then they're addicted to it. So you develop it. You develop. Now, we can give all kinds of reasons for our weakness, but what I'm going to say is they always come from our sinful nature. Of course, God can intervene supernaturally and put a stop to those weakness. I've heard people who give up smoking once they come to Christ. Have you heard that? I've heard people who just temperaments change drastically after they come to Christ. Some people heal supernaturally like heal of migraine, heal of sinus, immediately after they come to Christ. But I can tell you in all my Christian experience and biblically that 
there are surely weaknesses that God permits in our life so that we can receive more grace when we struggle through those weaknesses with the help of the Holy Spirit. And that's why I'm going to bring you to the second point. Okay, the second point. How to see and manage our weakness in the light of the gospel truth, especially those that are not immediately taken away after you come to Christ. Okay, this is the gist of the message now. Point two. Okay, number one. Okay, I'm going to have four points for you here, over here. Number one, you have to see that your weakness is to humble you before God so that you learn to live in reliance on God's grace. So I would encourage you not to prove yourself because of your weakness. If I am a slow learner, I don't have to feel jealous of some people who are fast learners. I don't need to prove that I'm better in a lot more other areas so as to cover my flaws. Instead, ask the Lord for grace. Okay? You know, I have my limitation. You know, I have problem with you know, writing Chinese character. You know, sometimes I need to preach to the Chinese people. Sometimes when I'm preaching, writing, I know I wrote the wrong characters. No, those kind of things. Sometimes people embarrass me. Sometimes you know, people just correct me pinpoint, those kind of things. But the thing is, I've come to terms with it in a way that, God, you know, there are certain things in my life that for some reason that I know or I don't know, you know, that you let it remain in me. Even as I try my very best to improve on it, but I couldn't, mm, I, I couldn't write as well as some people or read as well as some people, and all. But the thing is, I don't lament or feel inadequate. But instead, I ask for more grace, and God strengthen my heart to keep learning and move forward. Now, that's the thing, number one. Okay, I want all, all of us to know that weakness is always to humble us so that we live, learn to rely on God's grace. That's number one, okay? Number two, if need to, Okay, if need to, put in more prayer and effort in the areas we are weak at. If it's studying, or if it's like preaching, or playing a sports, or learning a musical instrument, put in more effort if you need to. Don't take shortcuts. Cultivate perseverance. If you're always having problems with interpersonal relationship, you put in more time to engage Listen and observe. Keep trying to understand how people think and feel instead of just wanting quick fix. Instead of just be with pe people that accept you. You get what I mean? Of course, I know all of us have some tendency or temperaments. We prefer some, some types of people. Right? You know, I myself, I, know, I get along with certain types of If I like to talk, I like people who listen. I don't like people who talk too much also, you know. But the thing is, if you do that, you will never get along well with certain types of people. So, somehow, you've got to pray to God, God, if I'm weak or inadequate in that area, I'm going to put in more prayer in that. So, at the end of it, listen up. At the end of it, what do you get out of it? After you put in effort, you may not even be as good as those who can do well naturally, but you manage to cultivate some godly character, like perseverance, endurance, persistency, and you grow to empathize with people with similar weakness. Now, that's the thing that God finds favor with. God finds favor with those who desire godly characters. Then the results itself, okay? So I can see why Paul is writing 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, encourage Timothy. Because Timothy, he's just born timid. Now, all this while, he has the spirit of timidity, but I still keep writing to him, Timothy. God didn't give a spirit of timidity, <laughs> no, but of power, love, and self-control. You know, keep writing to him. So the, the best way 
to deal with your weakness is not to run away from the truth, but to keep hearing the truth and pray towards the truth. Now, that's the way to do it. Okay, I want all of us, put this in your heart. Don't run away from it. Keep dealing with it. I know sometimes it doesn't feel good when you are reminded of your weakness again and again. You know, sometimes, you know, people say, Pastor, I've tried what you say. Say, for instance, someone is feeling very inadequate, you know, like Timothy, timid easily. He said, Pastor, I already prayed, but cannot lay, I'm still fearful. Cannot, I'm still inadequate. Yeah, you can still be that, you know, but keep moving towards that. Don't give credibility to your feelings. You get what I mean? Give credibility to the truth. Sometimes we believe our feelings too much. We will have feelings, but don't believe it and rely on it as if it's everything. Sometimes it's the truth that leads us on the right direction. And always, I would say, feelings, just, just a direction, okay? It's a signal to us, okay? You've got to start praying. But it's not meant to direct you in every way, okay? You understand that, okay? So, put more prayer in areas you are weak at, okay? Number three, learn to use your weakness for the gospel. Use it for the gospel. To the weak, I became the weak. I might, so that I might win the week. I have become all things to all men so that I might save some. That's what Paul said. So you must come to realize from this verse that there is always a godly reason for your weakness. Be it whether you are a weaker gender or you have some consistent weaknesses you are struggling with. Sometimes weakness that are bothering us may not be a shame. Instead, it is meant to bring comfort to people, all right? And also to lead people to the saving grace of God. I know people who suffer from depression, you know. Uh, one good, good example is Pastor Paul Washer. You know, this is a re renowned reformed preacher. He has depression. He says, sometimes I'm still struggling with it. But, but the whole point is, he has come to a stage where it's no longer dealing with the depression. You know, how can you force yourself not to be depressed? So the thing is, while he could, and he just helped people who are depressive. And he has forewarned his wife, that I have this problem, you know, so sometimes when I react randomly and all, you know, to just help me along, you know, Sometimes I, I will feel suddenly very negative and all. Just help me along, you know, and I'll, I'll be over soon. So that's the thing. People with depression develop empathy for people who suffered in the same way. <clears throat> you know, in Singapore, this is a very competitive society. Subtly, everyone know in this society, it's all about winning, about being better, about being more superior. But let me say again, as Christian, there is no winning without winning souls. Okay, I say that again. There is no winning without winning souls. So in this society, if all we care about is having a better life, being more superior, doing well in every single thing that I'm doing, you know, I think that's not God's heartbeat. Even with leading a church, I, I believe with all my heart, it's not how professional our choir is, our worship team is, or how beautiful is the church building is. You know, it's not that. They all this make no sense if no souls are being saved. This is a world full of painful people. Many people are stuck in their weakness. And with our weakness, God has destined us, ordained us to help people come to the gospel of hope. That's the thing. So I would say it's good if you know you have certain weakness in you and you know you are not getting rid of it, but you are using it for the gospel. And when you come to that point where you could be like, Paul, I delight in my weaknesses, in my difficulties and all. So this is true spirituality. Now, okay, so 
we, we need to change our uh, mindset and thinking as we hear this message. Number four, number four, okay, struggle through your weakness, no matter how long it takes. Now, listen to me, people. When you struggle through your weakness, don't keep saying, when is this ending? I have enough. I want to feel free and empowered. Now, by saying that, you know you are not struggling to true liberty. You are just struggling, hoping for the feeling of struggles to end. You get what I'm trying to say? That's not the Christian struggle. The Christian struggle tells you that as long as you live in this body of sin, as long as you live in this sinful world, there are battles to fight. There are wars being waged against your soul. You see, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Wage war against your soul. So I'd like all of you to know that when God created your soul, your soul is made for eternity. It cannot find enjoyment just in this life. Do you know how do you get over your struggle, that is when everything in you is looking towards eternity. You get what I'm trying to say? Eternity. This is an eternal gospel. So we live this life with the knowledge of an afterlife. Now, you see, many a times when we struggle in this world, we struggle with ourselves, with finance, with weaknesses, with everything in this life, uh, with our kids not doing well, you know, with our job not doing well. Now, we struggle and hope. Now, the feeling of struggle will end. But actually, you are hoping for the results to end. You're hoping for good results to come, the bad results to end. You get what I mean? But actually, God wants you to struggle through until you put your hopes in eternity. And that's when your struggle really ends. So even as I live my life on this earth, you know, I know there are many things we need to get busy with. Kids, we have to take care of them. You know, marriages, we have to be happy. Sometimes we go for a tour, you know. But nothing is too happy when we're just doing it just for this world. All right, so I, I'm going to live with you with that, okay? Struggle through no matter how long it takes, okay? <clears throat> uh, a few days, you know, uh, you know we, we have our meet parent session, you know, so I went to school, you know, my kids, meet my kids' teachers and all. <laughs> so, uh, in the midst of that, I met some parents, you know, you know, every time it's, when I do those things, you know, and I talk to teachers, I talk to parents, I get a sense of this worldly culture. And what all the parents are looking at, now, everyone is concerned for their child's well-being, every child, every parent, you know. Of course, we too, you know, we are concerned of my child's well-being, you know. But I see the way many parents, when they are concerned with the child well, even Christian parents, they are concerned with the here and now. What, how well they are doing now, academically, and uh, the behavior, and the conduct, you know, now. It's always now. And they find comfort because the teacher think well of my child now. But ever since I know the gospel, I tend to think, actually, what is most important is, now, I have to think, my child, 30 years, 40 years down the road, can he take setbacks? Will he choose God when he's tempted by the world? Can he go through the life trials with resilience, especially, you know, being strong in the truth? And even along the way, when he met with setbacks and failures, or his weakness is shown, can he use his weakness 
to glorify God. Now, ever since I know the gospel, this thing is always in me. When I look at my kid, you know, 12 years old, like 13 years old, how about when I, they are 23 and 33? And that thing always gets into me, you know, when I, when I make certain decisions and when I pray for my child, I know what God you want in a man, in a woman, in your child. You know, I pray, God, let us have that kind of understanding. You know, I know it's not easy. I've been preaching this message for like many years, like 50. I look at all the our mothers, you know, and you start having your child, you know, carrying them right when they are infant. Now, and then you realize along the way there is so much expectations and expectation change to worry, anxiety for them, you know, whether they are doing good or no good, and how is the definition of good and no good. Now, this, these things just torment us in this life. I'm going to talk a lot about that tomorrow, okay? It just torment us. But after you know the gospel, you must come to a point that you see beyond that and you pray beyond that. And it's not a one-day thing. It's not a one-day. You've got to go through this repetitively. Because as your child grows up, they will create new problems and new challenges to you. <laughs> you get know what I mean? Even though they may bring you happiness at times, comfort, but they will create undue worry in you. Even when they get married, if their marriage is not happy, it's really a worry to you, even when you are like 70, 80 years old. And you hear, I hear Christian parents, you know, they're, they're so in pain because they see that children marriage doesn't work out. You know, the children is in their 40s, you know, that kind of thing. So you have to learn right now. When your child is only an infant, you have to learn right now. So that's my prayer for all of you, okay? Struggle through. Never mind if you are feeling the, the struggle, the weakness. Struggle through. Keep going. Keep going for the sky, you know? God, take me on higher ground. Keep praying towards that. No, that's, that's the way I go through my Christian journey, okay? So, <clears throat> if, if this message, okay, uh, if you say amen to this message, no, I would, I would see a few evidence in your life, okay? I would see a few evidence, okay? Number one, okay, I'm going to end with this. That few evidence, if you struggle through your weakness, number one, you will see that you begin to be less easily affected by feelings and emotions. Now, you see, we are, after all, humans with feelings. I'm not saying we are going to be feelingless and emotionless, but you're going to be less affected less affected. You get what I mean? Now, this world is all about feelings and emotions. Yesterday, I was just telling my child, you know, do you know Satan plays with people's emotions? He can make you so angry and then you kill a person and regret. He can make you so greedy and you gamble and then you lose everything and you regret. Now, it's feeling thing. At that moment, a spur of moment, you just believe what you see and what you feel. Actually, it's not true. This is a world of deception. I can make you buy something that you don't need because I advertised it so well and I create that need in you and make you feel that you need it. Okay, so you buy it, then I earn your money. You know, you get what I mean? This is a world that goes around where Satan plays with people's feelings. Fear, pride, greed, you know. These are the things. But the person who struggled through weakness, he knows. Even if I feel this way, I'm going to choose the way God determined. Choose the way of the truth. Now, that's number one, okay? So you're going to not be controlled by feelings and emotions. You're going to be controlled and led by the truth, number one. Number two, strangely, you're not affected by feelings and emotions so much but you develop more empathy towards people's weakness, right? This is paradoxical, right? On one hand, you're not so affected by emotions, by what you see in circumstances, but on the other, you empathize with people who are struggling in their weakness. Now, these traits of love develop in our lives 
when we struggle through weaknesses in our life. So that's why I keep saying one of the things I really worry for the church nowadays is that the church has been institutionalized, systemized. Everything is standardized. Ministry becomes mechanic. Counseling becomes standardized. People come to you, okay, you say the same thing to them, you know, and tell them no, no, this is the problem. Or some people nowadays, they, they develop some ways to bring comfort to them, hugging people, hug people. You go to MLM, and people hug each other. In the church, you come hug you so that you feel better. Now, hugging is a natural thing, but you cannot standardize it. You know? Everyone come to the church, you hug them. No, it must come naturally. So I like everything to be spurred on by the Holy Spirit, naturally, out of sincerity and genuine love. Now, that's the thing, okay? So why couldn't you do that? Because you didn't struggle enough through your weaknesses. You know, some Christian I met, they always say, I hope to pray and then quickly see results. I pray and I'm liberated straight away. No. The, this is ideal. But usually, God will make you struggle through weakness. And you keep asking why, and you rationalize, why God, not the other person, but why me? But God is doing a beautiful thing in you. Now, that's the thing, okay? I want you to get this straight. Now. Number three, <clears throat> When you have struggled through weaknesses in your life, you will value church meetings. I tell you why. Because that's the only thing that sustains your eternal joy and hope. I mean, honestly, if people would ask me, why do you come to church? So much fun to have during weekends, so much things to do, so much things to be busy with during weekends. Why do you come to church? My simple answer is because I need the eternal sense. I can, you know, Go out with my kids, you know, spend time with my family, catch a movie, go shopping you know, during weekends. I'm not going to feel contented because I know there is this eternal soul in me. Every time I come to church, I'm reminded of the eternal truth, my belonging. After I'm satisfied by that, then I go and catch a movie, spend time with my family, go shopping, buy something. I feel contented, you know. But I cannot be doing all these things, having the fun, getting the achievements in life, without the sense of eternity. I feel lost and empty. Now, that's the fact. That's why I say you will value church meetings when you have struggled through your weakness. If we didn't struggle through our weakness, smooth sailing life all the way, and always hoping things will go well, and things really go well for you all throughout your life, you will not see the need for church, really, I tell you. Now, I've been through this many times. I've been through this. And um, <clears throat> of course, I'm not saying that God should give us trouble in our lives, you know. But I think it makes a lot of sense to pray for true liberation. God, pray through your weaknesses and wrestle with God when, when you have weaknesses. You know, not just stay there and wait and for things to turn well. <clears throat> and number four, the last one, okay, the evidence you will receive through struggling in your weakness that you will become more anointing in lifting people out of their weaknesses. Now, that's the most important. First, we are open to share our weaknesses. But I realize that's not enough because nowadays, people share about their weaknesses, setbacks a lot, you know. And nowadays, you know, you listen to people like Jack Ma, they share about their setbacks and failures. But the fact is they are successful now. So you listen to that and you feel, okay, he is talking about his past, but I'm in his past now. You know? <laughs> so it's not enough to just talk about your setbacks and your weaknesses. It's important to know, even as you're struggling in the midst of weaknesses, you are enabled to help another person and lift him out of weakness together. Now, that's the thing I'm, I'm looking for in our lives. You get what I'm trying to say? When Paul lifts someone out of weakness, it's not as if he's over. I'm over, okay? No, he's still struggling. There's always battles to fight in his life. There's always persecutions that he's facing. There's anxiety in his... But he's sorrowful, but always rejoicing, you know? Always relying on God. And at the same time, he's helping someone through their depressive moments. You know, the emptiness and all. 
And that's the amazing thing about the gospel. Become anointed in lifting people out of their weakness. <clears throat> and let me end with this, okay? Nowadays, you know, because of so many messages that we have heard, sometimes I realize <clears throat> when we are counseling people in the church, we become very conceptual. You know, conceptual? You give people a conceptual answer. Like say, for instance, uh, someone with a problem come to you and you say, okay, greater the problem, greater the blessing. Hallelujah. Amen? Okay? Now, this is conceptual. You get what I'm trying to say? Of course, I know that's concept. Okay? But my heart is not being lifted out from the gloominess. You get what I mean? So, don't just give conceptual answer. The sermon can be conceptual because the sermon is to educate to make you understand. But when you are counseling people or when you are in forums and all, you know, if someone brings out a problem, you got to listen attentively to their problem, ask critical questions, help people out from that process of struggle. Now, you got to go through that. You start with your spouse first. Start with your children. And then you work on your brethren. And then you become more anointed. Then you, you know what people are going through in their heart. The heart is a complicated thing, okay? It's not as if you give one answer and people can be lifted out from their struggle. So you yourself have to struggle through the weakness, through your own weakness. How are you feeling when you are lacking? How are you feeling when your boss don't think well of you? How do you struggle through those things? Now how you struggle through, and then when a brethren come with a similar problem, you know how to lift him out from that struggle. Okay, that's the amazing thing of struggling through your weakness. Okay, that's the end. Okay, so I'm, I pray for you. Okay, it's not an easy message. Okay, it's easy for the head to understand, but hard for the heart to absorb. Okay, so we're going to do forum later. I'm going to pray through this. Okay, uh, so welcome everyone. And those newcomers, join us for forum. Okay, come, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the words given us. Um, once again, we thank you for the revelation that you've given your Apostle Paul. And thank you for the, all the experience that he has written down in the words of truth that you have taught us today with regards to struggling through our weakness. God is not so easy, but thank you for the Holy Spirit that has given us to intercede for us and to help us. So we look to you. I pray that with each sermon that we've heard and what we have understood with our head can be internalized with our hearts. So Lord, I thank you. I look to you and pray for a blessed um, forum session later on and let it help us to confirm your words deeply. So we thank, we thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.